Well, let's get started. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Jack Haskell, and I have the honor for working for the Pacific Crest Trail Association and the special privilege of giving the introduction to this project. My main goal for this webinar is to invite you to participate in the Five Needle Pines Community Science Project on the Pacific Crest Trail. It's going to be successful if you all engage. You can engage through inviting others, talking about it online, sharing this webinar, blog posts, storytelling, and most of all, doing what we're going to teach you how to do tonight, which is community science around the five needle pines that live along the Pacific Crest Trail, this narrow corridor of land from Mexico to Canada. The PCT is a national scenic trail. Many of you already know about it. So this is a very brief welcome and invitation to participate. It's an invitation to engage deeper in the natural world, to engage in the climate change crisis, to engage in science, and to engage on the trail and also online. So we think it's a great opportunity. It's one of the uh, first major community science projects of the Pacific Crest Trail. It is possible because of the presenters in this webinar who are championing this project. Next slide, please, Michael. The Whitebark Pine Ecosystem Foundation does incredible work. We're so glad that they came to us with this project idea and an opportunity for you all to engage. Next slide. The California Native Plant Society, if you don't know about them, so many wonderful programs, so much important work, bringing real expertise and community to California, botany world, to this project, uh, an in integral part of the Pacific Crest Trail community. We're, we're appreciative of them. And then Aaron Wells, who you'll see later. Uh, this is uh, the Pacific Crest Trail Association welcoming you once again. We protect, preserve, and promote the Pacific Crest Trail uh, for all the benefits that it provides. If you engage in the Five Needle Pine Project, you are a volunteer. We also run uh, trail maintenance volunteer projects, and we're looking for people to sign up on our website, get more involved in the PCT. Thank you again, and take it away. All right. Thanks, Jack. That was great. Um, I see some names flying in here, people that are definitely going to be out hiking the trail this summer, so I'm excited. I want to start off with just celebrating the conifer itself. I mean, basically, if you hike the PCT, you get to see some of the best conifers on Earth. Uh, this is one of my uh, the back door of where I used to live in Wrightwood, which is along the Pacific Crest Trail, looking from Baden-Powell, which has probably the most charismatic conifer on the entire trail near its summit, a limber pine up there. Looking towards Mount Baldy, you can see San Gregonia away in the distance. This is a picture from 2011, uh, June 4th, 2011, our last big snow year. This is me looking towards the Mineral King, not technically on the PCT, but I'm on Alta Peak, looking across some foxtail pines. And then the Marble Mountains. Can't go wrong uh, with this view either. The PCT kind of skirts um, just to the east of the Marble Rim. So starting off with a celebration of the conifers, but I just want to talk quickly about what is a conifer. Well, a long, long time ago, plants crept onto the, to the surface of the earth. Early vascular plants included horsetails, club mosses, and ferns. So these were the first things that grew up. But they had spores, which was limiting. The first two seed groups were the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. The gymnosperms are about 365 million years old. So these are the part of this, this group is the conifers. But when that asteroid hit 65 million years ago, there was a major shift. We know the shift from the animal world when the dinosaurs um, basically went extinct, but the conifers also mostly went extinct. And that's when the uh, flowering plants really took over the earth. But that wasn't the end of the conifers. And I'll tell you about that in a second. A couple of relatives of these conifers, things that aren't super common in California, Oregon, and Washington are the cycads. These are mostly tropical. The netophytes are common in the California deserts. There's about 70 species of these um, around the world. The ginkgo, there's only one species that remains, but we're all pretty familiar with it because 
It's a landscape plant. And then the conifers, at least the female ginkgo is a landscape plant. The male conifers have been left, or the male ginkgos have been left behind. But the conifers, this is our focus today, mostly the pines. And there's about 630 species left. And this is from around 20,000 species from before the asteroid. So a little bit of wow though, why do we love conifers or why are you gonna learn to love conifers? Well, they're first they're exclusively wind pollinated so they don't have relationships with um, insects like the flowers do or in any sort of animal really for that matter. Uh, they often grow in these suboptimal areas. So places that the soil is poor or places where it's really cold and then it fluctuates to hot and back to cold again. So they kind of live where the flowering plants don't necessarily want to be. They're generally restricted to higher elevations and latitudes, hence uh, the celebration of the conifers along the Pacific Crest Trail, walking one of the longest cordilleras in um, Western US. And then this is wild to me. This is conifers, there's less than 1% of all plant species on earth are conifers, yet they still cover 30% of the forested land. So even though there's this major decline in conifers, they still do really well in the right places. They're also the largest, tallest, and oldest living things on the planet. And this, in, now all three of these are in California. So I'm gonna familiarize you really quickly with the pines that we're gonna be working with. This is a limber pine. This is another picture from the San Gabriel Mountains. I was lucky enough to live there, like I said, for a while. And I really fell in love with the PCT through here, but also, the amazing conifers along the way. And you'll see uh, the range map, there's not a lot of limber pine along the Pacific Crest Trail. It's basically in the transverse ranges and then a few places in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and once you get north of Yosemite, they're gone. The sugar pine, this is um, basically, this is the one of the most charismatic pines in the world. It's the tallest pine, one of the tallest with ponderosa pine. It's the largest pine and it also has the largest, I'm sorry, the longest pine cone of any conifer. And you'll recognize them, this is along the Pacific Crest Trail above the Klamath River and the Klamath Mountains. But you'll recognize them by the way they hold those cones out and sort of extend that seed far away from the mother tree so that it flutters down and germinates a safe distance away. Western white pine become common in the Sierra Nevada all the way north to the Canadian or Canada border. Um, I like to think of them as the dinosaur foot tree. They have this real charismatic shape, buttressing, and then the scaly look to that dinosaur foot as it plants itself into the ground. This is a picture from the Trinity Alps wilderness along the Pacific Crest Trail. And then uh, White Park Pine. So this is the organization that I'm a board member of, the White Park Pine Ecosystem Foundation. And this is sort of the impetus for this project, but we care about all the five needle pines, but really the White Park Pine and the western white pine are the two that are struggling the most currently. So again, we're looking to collect as much information as we can about all these five needles. But I like to think of the white bark pine as that true alpine summit tree that uh, you know helped help drive this project in a lot of ways. And then lastly, a California endemic a foxtail pine. They only live in two pockets along the Pacific Crest Trail, basically from uh, the southern Sierra Nevada and Sequoia National Park. You really start to to pick them up there, uh, just north of, just into Kings Canyon, and then they disappear. And then you get to see them again when you reach the Klamath Mountains uh, in the Trinity Alps. In particular, there's a wonderful stretch of the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, just, uh, just as you enter the Trinity Alps, really, that's, that's one of my favorite stands of this tree. And then here's a little schematic. You may have seen this online, but basically it's where these trees live along the Pacific Crest Trail. So Limber pine, sugar pine show up first in the Laguna Mountains, but then the limber pine are intermixed with sugar pine, intermittently foxtail, and then white bark and western white from central Oregon north are the only five needle pines. All right, so that's our quick introduction. I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron to discuss threats. Hey everyone, good evening. My name is Aaron Wells. I'm a vegetation ecologist and I live up in Winthrop, Washington, up near the north end of the Pacific Crest Trail. So I was going to start out by talking about threats to five needle pines. Uh, here's three of them, uh, bark beetles, uh, white pine blister rust uh, can cause dieback, um, and then also uh, mistletoe. And that there's, there's some interactions with climate change and drought with these threats. Uh, next slide.
Um, and wild, wildfire is another threat. And again, there's an interaction with climate change there, where as, as the you know the climate changes and areas get hotter and drier, there's more fires. In the forest spurn, uh, the mountain pine beetle um, is another threat. And uh, you know that scale bars really demonstrates just how tiny that beetle is, but how destructive it can be is um, is on the next slide. You can see some dieback here. This is in Wyoming. Uh, white bark pine. This is a photo from uh, NPR. Next slide. And this slide is it's kind of complex, but but it's I, I show it for that reason. You know, to understand these threats and uh, to find needle pines, there's uh, complex relationships. And uh, this is this is a, a diagram specifically for white bark pine, but it illustrates that you know there's interaction between the climate and fire and the pine beetles. There's um, the Clark's nutcracker for the white bark pine is important for seed distribution. Um, there's secondary hosts for white pine blister rust. Um, those secondary hosts and white pine blister rust, there's interactions with the climate. So we need good data to understand, um, to help understand these threats and help the, the five needle pines. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna, hopefully we at this point, we've uh, piqued your interest in five needle pines and uh, talked a little bit about the five needle pines you'll, you'll see along the Pacific Crest Trail and also uh, some threats to those uh, five needle pines. I'm going to shift to just the next few slides to talk about uh, community science, also called citizen science, and what it is and its a, its a pros and cons, and, uh, and and then how we can sort of optimize citizen science to get good data. Uh, so what is community science? Well, it's when the general public works with scientists to collect data um, to answer scientific questions. And iNaturalist is one platform uh, online that people use to record uh, observations for citizen science. Um, and you can go to, there's the website there. Uh, it's a joint initiative with the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic Society. And it works by crowdsourcing, getting people involved, uh, recording observations, taking photos, uploading those photos to projects like this that we're talking about tonight. Uh, and there are some advantages to, the, to, to citizen science and there are also some disadvantages and challenges. So I'm gonna first talk about advantages on the next slide. Well, actually, how does it work? <laughs> um, well, and we're going to talk a little more about this later, but you know, essentially, you take photos of observations. In this case, you'll take photos of five needle pines. You post those photos to iNaturalist and add identifications. You may add them yourself. You may not know, and 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 then that, uh, and then there's people out there that will look at your observations and add an identification. Um, there's lots of ways that it can go. Uh, Ideally, you know, once you get more than one person to a few, you know, one person agrees with you, at least one person, then it goes, goes to research grade. And then that data is has a higher quality ranking and, and uh, can be used for scientific research. And so the higher number of observations that agree on the ID, the, the, the higher the confidence in that ID, essentially how it works. So next slide. Um, so it's some of the advantages of, of community science are that it's cost effective, um, you know, by crowdsourcing and getting uh, lots of people involved, you can get a lot of data really fast for, for uh, li very little money. And conservation projects, you know, they're, they're often not well funded. Uh, you can get broad geographic reach with thousands of observers. Uh, you can supplement uh, uh, rigor more rigorous scientific studies uh, to boost the sample size. And you know you can use the platform to organize events like a uh, bio blitz um, using a more structured approach, and it's also fun and, and helps create awareness of the natural world. Next slide. Some disadvantages are that you know from a as a scientist, um, I'm always looking for data to be um, statistically rigorous, and so one of those elements of a statistically rigorous data is to make sure that it's spatially balanced, and so oftentimes citizen science data is, is not well balanced. It's actually unbalanced. It's concentrated near trails. In this case, this project is focused on it, on data near, near the Pacific Crest Trail, which is fine. And that's the, that's the study design. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, there may be other, there's other situations, I'll show you an example of it, where uh, data right near a trail doesn't help you extrapolate out to the broader landscape. Um, other disadvantages are that photos are often ineffective for positive ID. And so this is just sort of highlights the importance of taking really good photos. And we're going to talk about what kind of photos uh, you should take later on. Um, location quality can be a, pro a challenge. Uh, modern smartphones have a GPS, but sometimes uh, your settings aren't set up right. You may not get a good location. 
uh, and have a not a very good accuracy. And then the other piece is that it's reliant on experienced observers. Um, this is both a strength and a weakness is that the idea with a natural is that you're relying on experienced observers to go in and, and make the uh, identifications and to make those, 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 those observations research grade. And so um, that depends on, that relies on experts going in and actually looking at the observations. So there's a call to action here for not only folks to go out and collect the data and the observations, but also for people who are experts in conifer ID to get in and look at uh, the, the observations. Uh, next slide. And so here's that example of uh, spatially unbalanced observations. Slide's a little busy, but it's and it's from Alaska. It's a, I'm a, a board member of the Alaska Native Plant Society, and this is a, a project I worked on with them, a citizen science project. And you can see the, the dots uh, are the observations of plants. And the goal of this project was a floristic inventory of Chugach State Park, which is right near Anchorage. And but you can see there the observations are all concentrated in, in mostly concentrated in certain areas, especially in that southwest part of the park with that heat map in the upper left corner shows that bright yellow color where most of the observations are. And that's where there's, I think, six different trailheads. So, you know, trying to extrapolate, use that data to extrapolate to other parts of the park is challenging. And so it's important to get spatially balanced data. Um, OK, next slide. But, you know, so how can we uh, best you know, utilize scientific data and kind of get get the the benefits without the challenges. And so I, I sort of summarize this as outreach, education and engagement. So to enhance the benefits and address the challenges of citizen science data, I propose this this three pronged approach. First of outreach, which we're doing now with this webinar and through other other means. And uh, so it's, you know, basically focusing on specific scientific questions that a, a citizen science project is trying to address and appeal to people for support. So that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're, we're appealing to you <laughs> to um, participate in this project. Uh, the other piece is education and uh, it's providing people with knowledge needed to contribute high quality data uh, that will have the highest and greatest impact for future research that incorporates citizen science data. And again, this uh, webinar is just a brief introduction to those five meal pines. And we also are gonna uh, introduce you to some reference material at the end that can help you um, make good identifications of you know, pines. And, uh, and so basically, you know, these, these three things together, we have engagement um, finally as the, as the final piece. And so for non-scientists, it's recording data, uh, volunteering to be part of these projects, making identifications on iNaturalist, and uh, maybe becoming an ambassador for a local project. And for scientists, it's education, developing study designs for citizen science projects and expert level identifications. So next slide. And OK, I'm going to turn it over to Jose for talking about iNaturalist. Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you, Aaron, for that explanation of iNaturalist. Um, and I'll just go a little bit deeper into the project um, and talking about um, the photos as well and observations. So um, you know, um, next uh, slide, please. So a little bit more about the project. Um, so the Five Needle Pines along the Pacific Crest Trail is a community science project, like you all know. And uh, that's along the PCT uh, to help capture uh, observations on all the Five Needle Pines uh, in order to map and inventory uh, these five species. Um, so it is a collaborative uh, project, like we said, uh, between the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, the Pacific Crest Trail uh, Association, and CNPS. Um, so next slide. Uh, project requirements. Um, so uh, really, there. in order to participate, uh, whenever you upload an observation, there are a few requirements, right? Uh, one uh, is that you observe one of the five uh, needle pines. Um, so that's one of the requirements. Um, two is that it's got to be uh, detailed photographs. Uh, so like mentioned earlier, um, it's really important that you take, uh, you know, the best observation possible um, so that other people and also yourself can um, help identify uh, your observation, try to get it to research grade. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide um, that talks uh, about best practices. Uh, but the other thing, right, is that it's within one mile of either side of the PCT. Um, so as long as your observation meets those three requirements, it'll automatically get added to the project. Um, so to participate, it's pretty easy, right? Um, and um, 
you know, some of the optional things uh, that we highly encourage is, um, you know, adding additional observation fields. Um, so um, anybody can do this, but when you upload your observation, that's one of the things that you can do is, um, you know, add observation fields, which is uh, one needles and uh, fascicles. Uh, the other thing is if cones are shown. And then uh, the last thing is uh, pest and disease. Um, so next slide. Um, so here we have best practices and, um, you know, when making observations of, uh, you know, um, any of the, the five pines um, along the PCT, uh, you want to make sure that you, uh, you, you, you follow pretty much uh, these things, right? Uh, we want to get the best observations possible. So uh, the one thing that I can't express is just taking pictures, right? Um, so you want to take pictures of the needles per fascicles. Um, you want to get pictures of the cones as possible. Uh, if there's pest damage or disease, you also want to get a picture of that, um, right? You want to uh, get a picture of the entire tree and its environment, um, you know, the branches, the trunk, the bark. Um, so you want to make sure you get, uh, you know, more than one picture. Uh, that's one of the um, one of the tips that I have uh, in order to make the best observations possible. It'll help yourself later and it'll help others to help identify it. And um, yeah, I guess uh, next next slide. Um, here is an example of an observation that was taken um, by Aaron uh, of a, a um, white park uh, pine. And uh, if you go on to the next slide, um, you can see that, you know, it's multiple pictures of pretty much everything, right? So it's easier to identify. And um, whenever you uh, upload observations onto an actualist, it's pretty easy to uh, add multiple observations at a time. Um, so one thing that I do is when I go out, um, you know, I take multiple pictures of, you know, the plant, the tree, whatever I'm out observing. And then when I go back home, I'm able to just pretty much upload everything either on my computer or on my mobile phone. Um, it already has the metadata stored, uh, which is like the time and the location. So it's pretty easy to just upload all the pictures uh, per observation and uh, do that. And uh, next slide. Um, so how you can help, right? Um, so here's just some some of the steps to to help and how to how to participate in the project. Uh, so one is you know join iNaturalist. Uh, so it's you know you can join on your computer, but also make sure you download the uh, app on on your mobile phone. Um, so you can upload photos from your phone or the computer. Uh, you know the computer uh, the website on the computer usually has. Uh, more uh, capabilities, uh, especially when doing identifications, but you can pretty much do everything through your phone, right? Um, all you need is a smartphone uh, pretty much in that regard, uh, but you download the app and then you use your camera and uh, you're pretty much all set. Uh, you can join the project, uh, which is the five needle spine along the Pacific Crest Trail. You can just search it up. We have the links as well. Um, you can join the project that like that and stay updated with, you know, uh, project uh, journal post um, and all of that. And then, uh, you know, we have the the webinar, of course, that's happening right now. And then another way to also uh, participate, right? Not everybody has uh, equal access to the outdoors and going out to the PCT is, uh, it's, it's quite a ways for, you know, especially if you don't live nearby, but you can also help by spreading the word. Uh, you can also help by just joining the iNaturalist project and helping with identifications, try to get some of those observations to research grade. Um, and yeah, uh, again, uh, next slide. Uh, signing up on iNaturalist is easy. You uh, sign up with email um, and it's pretty easy to just set up a, a profile, uh, same thing on your phone. Um, and uh, yeah, once you have that, uh, you know, uh, I'll I'll leave my email in the chat if you have any questions on how to upload uh, observations or something like that. I have a ton of ton of uh, resources uh, that can help you get started, uh, especially on iNaturalist. Uh, in case uh, you're not too familiar, or if you just want to learn a little bit more, I'm also happy to help with that. And uh, yeah, I'll just pass it on to uh, to Michael. Okay, great. Thanks, Jose. So I think what we were 
thinking now is if people had any questions, I just want to make sure to clarify, you don't have to be an expert to identify the pines, right? If you think it's a sugar pine and you put down, or and it turns out to be a Western white pine, somebody's going to be there to help you correct that. So, you know, give it your best shot if you're out there on the trail. I think that's uh, maybe what I want to end with. So are there any, uh, anybody have any questions? Um, Donna, have you been tracking that? Or I guess, Jack, you're going to track it, right? There was one question in the chat about whether this uh, webinar recording will be posted. And yes, it will be uploaded to both the uh, White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation and the Pacific Crest Trail Association uh, YouTube channels. You'll be able to find it at pcta.org, find this project website, and we'll have it embedded or linked there as well. And we have another question. Uh, does everyone know what defines something as a five needle pine? And what is a fascicle? Uh, gentlemen? Good. Yeah, good question. Maybe that's what I should have started with. So the fascicle is the little tissue that binds the needles together in a pine. And uh, pines typically have multiple needles to per fascicle. Uh, in California, we do have a single leaf pinion that only has one uh, needle per fascicle, but all other pines are gonna have two or three or five typically. So the five needle pines obviously are gonna have the five needles per fascicle. So if you count those fascicles and there's three needles, it's going to be probably a ponderosa pine or a Jeffrey pine. Um, so anyway, if you see five needles in a bundle together, uh, take a picture of it. Capture the cone, capture the bark. Yeah, it's that I, I like the word bundle or a bunch. You look at the, the bunch of needles and count them. If there's five, upload it yep. to iNaturalist. We have some more questions. Do we need to adjust our settings in any particular way to ensure that GPS gets recorded with our photos? Jose, can you handle that one? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, so if you, um, I'm, I'm not too familiar with like a digital camera. Um, I'm, I'm sure those are uh, pretty um, updated now that it, it does the same thing as a smartphone. Uh, but the, the great thing about your smartphone is that uh, Typically, by default, uh, every picture that you take automatically stores uh, metadata, and that metadata includes uh, the time that you took the picture, and it also includes the location uh, by uh, coordinates. Uh, so even if you're out um, you know, hiking and there's no internet connection, whenever you do take a picture, it shows exactly where you took it. Uh, so it makes it super easy to just upload a picture uh, with those coordinates already in stored. Uh, a good way to check that, um, I know, uh, at least from experience, it, it's always been a default a default setting unless you change it to like not uh, do that with your pictures. Uh, but a good way to check is just, you know, take a picture at home um, of anything. <laughs> you can check through <laughs> iNaturalist uh, if you upload, uh, try to upload the picture. If it shows up uh, with a coordinate, um, then you don't have to uh, change anything. Uh, but also in the picture settings, uh, there's like a little eye for information. Uh, when you click on the little eye, um, you know, it should be whether you have an iPhone or you have uh, an Android, uh, whatever uh, smartphone you have, if you click on the little eye uh, for more information on the picture, uh, it should give you a, a location on where that picture was taken. Um, you, you can also, great answer, you could also email a photo to info at pcta.org, I-N-F-O at PCTA, and I can tell you whether it has metadata or help you out. Um, we're available. Uh, this is a question for all of us. Uh, what would you like to accomplish with this project? One thing that I hope to accomplish with this project is that people on the Pacific Crest Trail have a deeper connection to the natural world, that um, people aren't just purely staring at their feet while walking along, but they're looking around them, thinking about the botany and their place in the world and how they can help protect places. So that's one of my my goals for this. How about you? Jack, you've well said. Yeah, that's that's definitely a goal of mine. You know, I've also done a lot of 
work with these pines over time, over the last 20 years, and I've watched slow decline in many of them, uh, individuals or large populations. And it's just something we need to keep watching. And I think this is going to be a nice benchmark for future observations as well. Aaron, Jose, you want to add? I think just uh, raising awareness of the five needle pines and the threats that that they're uh, under, and uh, you know, so uh, you know, this project is a great way to do that. So please pass pass it along, let other, others know, and uh, spread the word. Yeah, um, all all great. Set, uh, well said. Um, I agree with everything, um, and um, I think one of the things that I'd like to see, um, you know, with community science is increasing access to outdoors. Uh, so seeing uh you know more people out there uh you know uh more bipoc the bipoc community being out um you know on the pct uh seeing younger kids um accessing uh outdoors and um yeah so uh this would this is a great project that um you know can potentially do that so i'm excited um next question we have three questions right now and we have time uh are there any plans to implement a project like this in the Rocky Mountains? Um, I'll take that. I, you know, when I cut this up and I reached out to Jack and Jose, um, I also reached out to the Continental Divide Trail Association because I hiked the Continental Divide Trail and I'm a, I have a long distance hiker and um, had some initial conversations. I'm glad we didn't launch it in two places this year. <laughs> But I think I definitely want to get something like this going on the CDT. I also am the uh, director of the um, board director of the Bigfoot Trail Alliance. If anyone's into hiking a little bit shorter trail, I want to implement something like this on the Bigfoot Trail soon. So, yes, we're going to get this thing out there. Yeah, we would love to in. be a, a big success and grow further. I'm, I'm a CDT alumni as well. And uh, if, if we can... Uh, proof of concept this with an engaged, diverse audience, and that this is valuable on the Pacific Crest Trail. Yeah, it spread everywhere. Sounds great. Uh, Brad has a question, a uh, general question about iNaturalist. Here in the East, there are a lot of non-endemic plants, but since I'm not a great uh, not great at identification, I might upload an observation of introduced species. Is that okay? Yes, of course. Uh, one of my favorite things that I've ever seen on iNaturalist is uh, people who are capturing like dead animals. Um, there is a wide scientific value of non-native, uh, non-endemic species. Aaron, you're the scientist. Would you, would you like to say more on this one? Yeah, I think there's incredible value in uploading uh, observations of non-endemic species, invasive species. It, it's just another form of data that land managers can use to target where those species are and to try to eradicate them or help control them. Next question, how, is, how important is it to see what is around the tree? You want to take that, Aaron? Or you want me to take it? Uh, I'll go. Yeah, um, I think it's it's important to get some context for the the environment for the tree. I think that's a really important piece, and I think just you know one or two photos is all that you need. Um, and it can also be good to just look around the base of the tree for cones or cone fragments, especially for white bark pine. Uh, the cones get torn apart by birds, and uh, you don't always find intact cones, but you can find the cone scales, and those are really important for identification. So uh, we have a great final question. Um, besides raising awareness, how will this information be used to protect the five needle pines? So one, one thought here is we need to see how this project goes. We, we need to see it be successful and generate a large data set. So this isn't like, in my view, it's not a 2023 project. If it's successful, we're just getting started on years of data collection. So it might well be that 20 years from now, the data that we collected this summer and next summer has uses that we haven't even envisioned yet. 
But uh, Michael, I know that you've been very involved in the white bark pine protections. Can you speak a little bit more about how uh, the Pacific Crest Trail transect could benefit the protection of those? Sure. Yeah, I mean, one thing is just where are uh, where is white pine blister rust? Where are bark beetles infestations high and active in any particular year? So, you know, those are things that you might not necessarily know you're catching, but if you picture take a picture of the whole tree, there's some branch dieback that might be a sign of uh, blister rust, uh, uh, you know, maybe a new instance of blister rust. And blister rust is a non-native fungal pathogen that has arrived in the western white pines from Europe. So this is a new, so relatively new last 100 years, been moving through pines. So, you know, tracking things like that, tracking even like recruitment, uh, which means new trees growing. You know, there's the foxtail pine, for instance, there's very little recruitment in the Sierra Nevada. Trees are not, juvenile trees are not sprouting. Saplings and seedlings are not there. In the Klamath Mountains, there's lots of them. So we can track where regeneration is happening, where trees are happy, maybe where they're not. Uh, and those are sort of just the the general um, answers. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's some other thoughts out there. Aaron or Jose, do you have any other thoughts? I can jump in. Uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned um, like white pine blister rust outbreaks. I mean, I think there's really there's a there could be a real great use for this data for land managers to be seeing almost real time. You know, where are we seeing those outbreaks, and then being able to respond. And uh, and and understand you know when they're happening. The other, the most really general piece I think of this data is just you know we can't protect the pines if we don't know where they are. And so just just that just knowing where the populations are uh, is really important. Yep. Okay. Now, truly, the last question: uh, <laughs> What about bristlecone pines? They are not along the Pacific Crest Trail. It's a, basically the foxtail pine is a very close relative of the bristlecone pine. Bristlecones live in the White Mountains and across the Great Basin into Nevada and Utah. Uh, Rocky Mountain bristlecones on the Continental Divide Trail, but no bristlecones along the Pacific Coast. Thank you all. Thanks to the presenters. Thank you to the attendees and thank you to everyone who watches this later on YouTube. But most of all, thank you for caring about the Pacific Crest Trail, about nature and getting involved. If you haven't yet, go download iNaturalist, join the Pacific Crest Trail Pine Project. We need to see the data, we need to see more uploads. I hope uh, whether you're a long distance hiker or this project is going to get you out on a day hike with your grandchild or whoever, it's a great way to spend some time on the PCT. So um, thanks for spending an evening and be well. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night.